Hello, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, let's just give any other uh, potential participants who are latecomers uh, another couple of minutes before we start. Thank you, and please stand by. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our last stop on the MC18 EY learning journey. Uh, this is the training number five out of the series of five, so the final stop, and we will dedicate it to the uh, entrepreneurship basics. Our e-gaming fundamentals in five modules already covered industry overview, marketing, design thinking, and the entrepreneur journey that we've heard yesterday. The final stop will be about entrepreneurship basics. And for that, I will hand over my word to Louis. Thank you, Marosh. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning here in Montreal. Um, last day of the week for you guys. You're going on the weekend, so I'm happy to be sharing this last day with you. Um, today, I will be talking to you about gaming specific entrepreneurship basics. Yesterday, we covered kind of my journey as an entrepreneur. Today, we're going to focus a bit more on gaming specifically. So, for those of you who were not here yesterday, I'm Louis René Auclair. I have 20 years' experience in the video games industry. I have acted in many different roles. I've started as a producer, as a studio owner, then business developer, and now I'm an agent uh, running the company Rocket Ride Games. Overall, at Hibernum, which was my big studio, the studio I created 10 years ago, uh, the studio grew from 12 to 160 people, generating over $60 million of business in five years. I've learned a lot through my years, uh, either in studio in development or in publishing work. I am now running an agency that's called Rocket Ride Games, which is basically helping studios around the world create better concepts, better pitches, find investor or publishing money, and then finally ship their games on the market. So that's what my company does today. The content, what we're going to talk about, we're going to be you know, looking at an entrepreneurship progression and journey and key takeaways. It's going to be very focused on some of my key learnings throughout the years and, and what I've made in gaming. So uh, not a big uh, table of content, but a lot of content to discuss. So let's look at the progression and journey first. So it's a, one of the weird position in, in, in the industry is that gaming entrepreneurship is not necessarily a natural progression. The fact that you are good at making games does not make you good at running a video games company. So if you look at specific skills to actually make video games, you know, you have to be good to work in a team. You have to understand the importance of your craft, what you're doing, but also it's important that you get the overall ensemble that makes a game. I, I often compare making games to having four different people around a table all wanting to make a round pizza, right? You have the pizza dough, everybody's trying to make it round. If somebody, art, design, technology, and production, if somebody pulls too hard on the pizza dough, it's going to be crooked, it's going to be a triangle and not a circle, and it's not going to look good. It's the same thing in video games. As an artist, as a designer, as a programmer, you need to push your craft as far as possible without pushing it so far that you completely um, crush the other uh, important aspects of a game. As a game maker, you also need to properly evaluate your workload and task and deliver those in time and in expected quality. What this means is most of the time a production will focus will work in sprints. A sprint is a finite amount of time for which you have to create your work during uh, that will you know finish as a feature. If the production is long, that sprint might last four weeks, but in a shorter production, those sprints might last two weeks. At the beginning of a sprint, you need to evaluate your workload. You have a big backlog of things to do, and you say, in the next two weeks, I can do these four things. So you have to be able to understand these things properly to know that you can deliver. Because if you always over promise and under deliver, the entire team is going to suffer. So what I really like to talk about when I talk about this evaluation aspect as a game maker is your definition of done. What do you consider a done feature, a done task, a done project? It's important that you share that with the team because for some people, 
a feature is done when I have put the last line of codes and the game can play. For example, your feature, you were tasked with the character being able to jump like in Mario Brothers. You do that feature, it's done, you put it done. However, for some other people, that definition is the feature is done, it's tested, bugs are found, and we fix those bugs for the first round. So they include the first round of feedback in QA. So all of a sudden, the time it will take to do that is much longer than previous. So you have to be aware of that to properly evaluate your workload. And then, of course, to make video games, you need skill and talent in a specific aspect of gaming. Programming, art, design, management, right? Are you an artist? Are you a game designer? Or are you a game programmer? And then those specific tasks, you have to improve yourself. You have to continuously learn and teach others on your team so that you're all a better team. However, the skills to run a company are different. You have to have team leadership and understanding of how video games are built. So you don't necessarily need to have made video games, but you need to understand how they are built. And team leadership is very important. Oftentimes in a company, people will look at their best artist, their best designer and their best programmer as their leader, the team lead or the project lead. The problem is not every great programmer is a great leader. So you have to look at the soft skills and their ability to manage other people first and foremost before you give them a lead to this position because otherwise you're just going to take out your best programmer, your best designer away from the game and put them on leadership skills and then all of a sudden people that could make the game better faster are no longer doing it. You need to have business and management knowledge regardless of how deep you want to go in this of how many services around you you're going to have you absolutely need to have the basics of being to able to understand accounting uh, understand human resources uh, rules and regulations where you live in your region to understand how to read a cash flow or some legal uh, understanding so that when you read a contract for a million dollars for one of your games you you don't have to rely on somebody else every time to do that you need to be good at networking and negotiation. Not everybody on the team of leadership, because you might be three owners, not everybody needs to be good at uh, networking and negotiating. But if somebody uh, is there and it's good, he needs to be in charge of that. So it's really important that somebody on the team is able to go to the trade shows, to be on conference calls, to go on to uh, you know, Zoom calls, uh, regional uh, meetings of all the video game studios or things like that so that you can create a network for your studio and start building relationships that will help you grow through the years. Uh, you have to be creative and resilient in the face of problems and challenges. Um, we talked about this yesterday, creativity and resilient, but uh, oftentimes uh, in a startup, in any startup, but video games also, it, it never goes exactly as planned. So you're gonna have problems to face every week, whether it's people quitting that are super important to your product, whether it's a client not paying a milestone because you didn't provide the quality you wanted, uh, whether it's your game shipping and not making money day one. There's a lot of different problems that happens as you run a company that you need to be able to manage. So when you look at this, a great game maker is somebody that's very specific in his skill and a, ma and a company owner is somebody that's general but focus in one's specific area of management. So as you start a studio, as you build a company, you have to remember those things. So I'm going to give you a couple examples of uh, how to become a video games entrepreneur, different journeys. And when I talk about early days, what's interesting here is that early days for video games is the 1980s, right? And it's not like people were joining the video games industry in 1920 because that did not exist. So the early days, it was very interesting how you could start a video game career. You could, you could have been working in a similar industry or field and have a passion for games. So you could be in advertising, you could be in toys, you can be in business, a lawyer, you could be a company owner of a completely different field. But if you had a, you know, a passion for games, the, it was kind of a, the rush for gold. It was wide open and you could just jump in. So a lot of people left other industries and came in and oftentimes they came in in an entry level position in a games company. 
often QA or assistant management, uh, production assistant, um, just people with skills that are more linked to organizational and coordination than it is to specifically game making. Because at that time, even the companies making the games did not really know how to make the games the best way. Then as you work in QA, which is quality assurance, basically testing games, making sure the games don't have too many bugs or highlighting the bugs that you find so that people can fix them, you can go grow through the ranks. Oftentimes, you're going to grow through the ranks by becoming a manager, manager of QA, ma assistant producer. So you're basically helping people produce games. And as you do that, you learn all the other skills. So that's what's interesting by uh, production assistant and QA roles is that some bugs you're going to find, some problems you're going to identify are going to be linked to art. Some are going to be linked to programming. Some are going to be linked to game design. So by getting all those problems, you're able to see the solutions. How will your team members solve those solutions? So that gives you a breadth of information that allows you to understand better how games are made. So it's a very vital time in a, in a career when you learn all these aspects. I mentioned this yesterday, my first big games company uh, job, I was as a producer and I didn't know a lot. So the first thing I did is tell everybody around me that, hey, I don't know how you do your job specifically, but I'm good at bringing people together. Please teach me, give me some details so I can be better at my job. And that level of humility that I personally showed really worked on my team. And then as you grow through the ranks, and you, you, you have definite, uh, definitely versatility and entrepreneurship. So using a project internally as your own little company, that's when you can start growing and then you can be in a place after working for a long time in the games industry to find great partners that complement you. Maybe you're more business and organization, you make good friends with a programmer and an artist, and then you go together and you make a company. Uh, that's a lot of what happened in the early days. Um, there's also through business and passion. So a lot of people like me um, start with a degree in business related field with passion for video games. So I was uh, a marketing major. I studied in marketing and then I, I worked in sales. I worked in retail, all fields that could give me experience that would help me manage a company or manage the marketing of a video game better. What that creates is a business entry level position in a games company. And that's really important. Today is very important because there's a lot more business and tree level position in games. You can be an economy designer. So you could be a, a finance or economy major and come in, in the video games business because games today, especially free to, free to play games, they require an economy. So if the game is free to play and then people need to buy in app purchases, you need to treat this like a complete store. And that to store is a closed economy with things to buy, things to sell, price points, promotion, all these stuff, right? So even a catalog in a way. So you need an economy designer that will balance that economy to make sure that the game has a progression that allows people to, to spend in the game. There's also marketing position for user acquisition, which means how do I create ads to um, get users for my game in free to play? There's a ton of business entry level position in a games company. As you as you work uh, on specific games, specific projects, specific departments, you gather experience, you improve your business skills, and then you find game makers that need business out to start. So then because you're not in a game making position, you don't produce a game, you don't design a game, you need to find a group of people that can make that game and you come to them and say, I know the business side. I have contacts to get deals done. You should work with me as a partnership and we're going to make great games together. So that's when you have a business degree and then it's through the ranks. So a lot of people will go through the ranks. So you're going to get a degree in games related fields. So there's a lot of games related field schools now. Um, I don't know in the kingdom, but in Europe, in North America, you can go study programming. You can go study game design. So you go there, you start, you do your full schooling, then you're going to get an entry level position in uh, in the games uh, industry by, you know, junior programmer, junior game designer, junior artist, and you're going to go through the ranks. You might start with somebody that does game design, uh, just elements for levels, just the game design elements for the main 
combat mechanic, the combat the designer. So you learn and then you start perform, um, improving your skill as a, as a game maker, as an artist, as a designer. Of course, you work on 7, 10, 20 games, so you make a lot of friends, a lot of different uh, people to work on games with. Then you find people that gather your, your experience and that, that com complement your skill, and then you can start a studio. So those are some of the main ways to become a video game entrepreneur. And there are some people that are just going to do it, right? Fresh out of school, hey, I know how to produce, you know how to program, you know how to make art, let's do it. That happens, it works. It's kind of like building a boat while you're crossing the Atlantic already. So it's extremely difficult, uh, but it's really rewarding. So I encourage people if they are willing to do it and if they have a way to get, you know, a bit of funds and a bit of help to get started, go in there and start making games. Shipping a game on Apple or on Google costs absolutely nothing. It costs your time to make the game with your friends and then to ship it and you never know. So there's a lot that you can learn by doing the the straight out of school approach as well. So that's the point we're talking here. How can I start my own studio after university? So this comes up with a very important aspect and, and let me explain you. So you're going to need to find complementary, passionate, resilient. We talked about this, creative people, and then you start making your game. The problem is you're not a company. You're not really a company at the time. You're a bunch of friends making games. And this can create problems for the future. So as you do this, you need to prepare intelligently the success phase where you're going to actually become a company. Because early on, what go what's going to happen is what you see here is that you have the game in the middle. That's the main focus. In any situation, if you want to be successful as a games company, you need to focus on the games first. This is what is the most important thing to do. So you start your five friends, you start making a game. However, none of your friends have the ability to do finance, accounting, IT, human resources. So you rely on external sources and services to do that. You're going to have an accounting firm. You're going to have an HR firm, an IT consulting firm. So the, they're going to manage all your things like that. And that removes a lot of the knowledge and power that you have over your company. Because then all of a sudden you're focusing on the game and people around you are focusing on your company. So you could be in a position that you have a very poorly defined partnership agreement. And then all of a sudden, if you had a success, what happens? Who gets the profits? Who gets the numbers of shares in the company? Your game sells and makes a lot of money. Who, who gets paid what? And then you're going to have external services that have a, a lot of leverage over you because they know your entire company and you don't. So this is a very risky approach. So when it comes to starting a company with friends out of university, I always say this. Gather your friends, talk about the game you want to do, and talk about the kind of company you want to build. Who's the CEO? Who's the CFO? All these things. If you don't have all those holes plug, uh, plugged, all those those position filled, like find services that can do it for you, but under the guidance of one leader, one CEO that can guide everything and that knows about all that. Because otherwise you will lose control and then you'll be in a situation that you might make a game that is not going to be yours in the end. And by the way, I really suggest and recommend everybody that you you note, take questions down, note, note them somewhere, write them in the question chat here. We're going to be able to ask questions and exchange at the end of the presentation. And that's my favorite part every time. I don't mind presenting to my own reflection in my screen, but having your questions is very interesting. Um, so how does a new game studio evolve into a company? How do you move from being a bunch of friends making game to a studio owner running a studio, a games company that is making games? Simple, you got to take control of your business. You got to work on the business and not necessarily in the business. And that is a very, that is probably a phrase I hear 10 times a year in the gaming world. So it's fine that you still want to do game design and programming and art, but you need to focus on working on your business. Because as your company grows, you are now responsible for your entire company and your teams, right? So you're responsible for their payroll, you're responsible for their um, experience at work, you're responsible for 
their vacation and all that stuff. So you need to know how this works. So you need to have this well prepared. So what it starts looking like is, is the, the diagram you see here. At the center, it's still the game. We said that the game is the most important thing. Around the game, you have the game teams, right? I said with an S, there can be only one game team. That's fine, that doesn't matter. But as you grow bigger, you might have four game teams working on different games at the same time. Um, and then you have company services. Some of these company services can be internal. Some of them can be external, depending. Um, but, you know, accounting, human resources, IT, finance, um, legal, like your lawyer, all those stuff. Um, and then outside of that, you have your ownership group, your ownership group, that's you and your friends that right before were working, the founders and game makers that were working on the game, now you're all of a sudden, you're outside. So that's your focus. Your focus is your business, not your game. The game is what makes the business successful, but the business is required to make the good game. So it's kind of a vicious circle that you need to make sure that both work at the same time constantly. That's where it gets really interesting and that's where it gets really fun to grow a business because all of a sudden you feel like you're almost playing a video game about making video games. You're, you're doing all these things at the same time. You're going to conferences, having a call about the game design thing. Then you travel back to a client that you're visiting in Europe and then you're on a call about uh, accounting services problems and things like that. So it gets very... Um, engaging. I really love that aspect. So one of the things I really like to talk about is my key takeaways of my years of being an entrepreneur in the games business. And, and I do that with very imagery and like very bright imagery so that you can understand what I mean. And uh, we're going to talk to some different points. And I'm sure if you're an entrepreneur in the games industry or just an entrepreneur, you're going to relate to some of these. And if you're not, Hopefully it's going to allow you to prepare better. So I have seven key takeaways I want to discuss. First of all is don't wear too many hats. Um, and th some of those are North American expressions. So I hope you understand them. Uh, if not, I'm going to explain them uh, deeper. So don't wear too many hats. Don't bite more than you can chew. It's always someone's top opportunity. Uh, the 80-20 rule that applies to many, many things. Sell the experience. Transfer your passion and don't do this alone. So <laughs> this almost feels like a quiz show, but uh, let me go into more details with you. First of all, don't wear too many hats. Um, that's super important, whether you're working on your game or in your company or on your company or whether you're doing biz dev or whether you're doing, you're a CEO that's more technologically uh, inclined. Every time you add tasks, Every time you add responsibilities to yourself, you increase the risk of dilution of your skills. So when I was at Hibernum, we talked about this yesterday. Uh, that's one of the focus on your strengths aspect, right? When I was at Hibernum, I was in charge of marketing, business development. I was in charge of production. I was in charge of free to play monetization and in charge of um, user acquisition and publishing five things for a studio of 160 for one person. It's ridiculously too much. And because of that, some of the things I was doing, I was not doing well enough. So find people that can help you with the things that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing. Work with your partners to disperse the workload properly. Find services from outside, from any uh, you know firm that can help you. But don't wear too many hats because you're going to, like him, you're going to crumble under the, the weight of all these hats. And none of these hats are going to suit you well, right? You're going to feel that you're doing a bad job at marketing, a bad job at design, and a bad job at biz dev. And it's extremely frustrating to feel you're doing a bad job when the number one thing, when you focus on, this, on the problem and not the symptoms, it's not that you are doing too many things, is that you, you, you cannot say no to these things. And all of a sudden, you, you need to treat the problem of, A, I want to do too much. Is it because you don't have confidence in other team members because you cannot delegate as a human being, which is one of my problems? So all these things are important to really have self-awareness to not wear too many hats. Don't bite off more than you can chew. So 
Uh, I think this image explains it extremely well. Um, this is for everything. This is personal. This is your task. This is your workload. This is your responsibilities. This is uh, your travel routine. This is everything. But also as a company, be careful not to go uh, above the steps that are needed to become successful. What I mean by that is if somebody offers you a game to make, I, it's very difficult to say no. I always say say yes and figure it out later. But there's also a threshold. There's a limit to that. If you've made games with five people and then all of a sudden somebody asks you to make a game that's going to require 80 people and a big budget of maybe $4 million, $5 million, you might not have that expertise. And that could, I won't say kill, but that could really hurt the company because you're going to have a tough time scaling up the staff getting payments on time because you don't have enough staff or enough experience. Organizing all these new people or organizing all these people in the company, that is extremely difficult. And I'll give you an example that happened to me personally when I was at Hibernum. Um, we were signing a new game called Saber's Edge with Amazon Game Studio, um, and it was a big contract for us. We were super excited. The problem is that we had signed three other games in the first three months of that year. So we did not have any staff available. And we've been working with Amazon for, I would say, a good nine months to get this deal going. And they finally said yes. So then in that situation, Amazon, like the biggest company in the world almost, says yes to you. You say yes back, right? We had two available employees uh, to work on this. And they say, great, this is signed. We're coming in the office Monday. This was a Friday. So by Monday, we needed to have a core team. A core team is lead tech, lead art, lead design, and the pro, the producer, everybody together ready to go. And we did not have that. So we scrambled over the weekend. I hired a game designer to come start the Monday. We took our um, director level, so director of programming, director of design, and director of art, and we put them in the meeting to pretend that we had a bigger team. And then on the Monday morning when Amazon arrived, uh, a very funny story, the new game designer that I just hired was sitting at the table with everybody and our director of technology comes in, says I introduce himself to everybody, but since he didn't know that guy, he introduced himself to him like if he was an Amazon employee. So he spoke to him in English instead of French because we speak French at the office. And I was like, oh my God, Amazon's gonna think that we don't know each other. So, <laughs> so that was a pretty bad moment the game went well, but not early on. In the first six months, it was a very difficult production because obviously we didn't have anybody to work on it. So we bit more than we could chew. And this ended up hurting us in the end because we got late payments, late approvals, low quality. So this was a very difficult situation for us. This one is very close to my heart, linked to business development. It's called it's always somebody's top opportunity. And there's an expression here uh, in North America that says one man's trash is another man's treasure. And what I mean about this is if you are doing work for hire or if you are pitching your own game to a publisher, let's say you have a great game idea and you want to talk to, to Devolver about it or Ubisoft. You got to remember this, that these companies, the publishing companies, the investors in games specifically, they will see 500 to 1,000 pitches a year. So the person you're talking to sees pitch decks, 30 pages, 40 pages, 500 to 1,000 a year, depending on the size of his publishing company. So that is a humongous number of pitches that they see. And what's important for you is to remember that there's always somebody in that pile responding to an RFP, sending a pitch that is extremely either desperate or extremely passionate about this pitch. So they will pull out all the stops. They will go in with videos, with a prototype, with a great pitch, with a, a clown with balloons. I mean, they're going to go all out with this. So if you're pitching to somebody, you got to pitch like if it's your most important opportunity. Because otherwise, if you just say, hey, I'll take this pitch, I'll see what I can win. If I can win, it's fine. If not, you're going to lose. But that 
loses focus for your team. Every pitch that you make internally is a loss of time, of effort and focus and money. So it's better to do less pitches and do them extremely well than to try to take them all and do them kind of, hey, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens always finishes and no. So um, remember that it's always somebody's top opportunity. So the 80-20 rule, point number four. This is, I mean, people talk about the 80-20 rule all the time. Um, the way I apply this rule to video games entrepreneurship, I apply it in the situation of 80% of the people you will meet will like you, and 20% of the people you meet you will not like you. And that can vary, right? If you're, if you're <laughs> a different kind of per person, it might be 75, 25, or 85, 15 if you're very likable, but let's put it as a general of an 80, 20 rule. And what I mean here is, if you're the one in charge of that relationship, if you're the one in charge of that specific aspect in your company, and you feel that you're in there 20%, don't force it. Don't say, oh, they're going to like me. I'm going to do everything I can for them to like me, and they're going to see they're going to want to do business with us. It's not going to work. Find somebody else in your team, in your partnership, in your surroundings that these guys, these company will like, and put that person in charge of that specific area. Um, that is extremely important because people could say that, oh, but it's business, right? You can do business with people you don't like. It's very difficult in the game industry because people tend to work with their hearts a lot. So I always recommend making sure that you find a good relationship with people. And I'll give you an example. When we were at Hybridum, we used to work a lot with the Lego company out of uh, Denmark. So the Lego construction uh, the toy company, and they were a great client. We love them. Uh, people from Denmark are much more subtle in their approach. Emotionally, they don't show a lot of emotion. And personally, myself as a French Canadian, I show a lot of emotion. So I, 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 I shake people's hands vigorously. Sometimes I give hugs and, and culturally it was not the best fit. They, they, they did not not like me, but there was there, there was discomfort when we would meet. And they told it to one of my employees. So one of my employees that they really liked, they told him, yeah, you know, your boss, uh, Louis, we, you know, we don't not like him, but he's very exuberant and he's, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to focus on, on the task and business with him. So it's not the best relationship. And imagine this, having one of your employees as a business owner, coming to tell you this, right? It was extremely difficult for him to tell me, but luckily um, one of my traits outside of being exuberant is that I'm also very understanding and, and I, I'm able to have those conversations with people. So he says, Louis, I need to talk to you. I'm like, okay, what's up? Well, I think you should not be on the Lego account anymore and let me take care of it because they go said this, this and that. Of course, it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit, but I'm like, you know what, you're right. The, the company, the deal, the game, and the relationship is more important than my feelings. I'll fix my feelings later. Let's fix that. So I removed myself from the account. I kept working with, with my team on the background, but I was not the face, the face of the company for them. And it worked out really great. We continued the relationship for over two years, and it, it worked out for everybody. So sometimes humility and the ability to understand the 80-20 rule allows you to make better business for a long time. Sell the experience. That is for everybody. It's not only when you're pitching um, your, your game to a publisher. It's when you're pitching your game to your team. It's when you're pitching your game to your partners, to a marketer, to an investor. You always need, need to sell the experience. That is one of the very old sayings, right? And Volvo is a great experience. That's the example. That's why I put Volvo there. Volvo never sold the fact that they had the best brakes, the most hard metal chassis, and the most um, the most number of airbags or the, the less dangerous um, uh, wheels. What they sold is every design, every Volvo we design can look like this because they are safe as a house and your family, your family will always be safe in a Volvo. And that was the longest time, I think, for 
almost 20 years that was how they marketed their cars. We're the safest car. And I remember ads on TV of Volvo flying off cliffs and not being destroyed and all that. So they don't sell you the airbags or the brakes. They sell you the experience of being safe. And when you pitch a game, when you talk to your team, and when you plan production, you should always sell the experience. And I'll tell you how you do this. So let's say you're, we'll go back to the jumping, the Mario jumping. Um, you have a feature in which, in a side scrolling game, you have to jump. So, the way you're going to explain this as a producer, as a designer to the rest of the team, the artist, the programmer, is as an experience. So, as a user, as a player, I'm expected to be able to jump when I press this button. The jump will vary in height as I press harder. And if I just tap, I'm going to do a small jump, right? So that's what I want to do as a user. Then you can have more experience. As a user, if I press a second time during mid jump, I will do a double jump to reach higher places, right? So in the same direction that I am going, pressing twice will give me a double jump. So you always talk about as a gamer, as a player, I want the experience to be as follows. So it's much more clear for animators, for programmers, and even for designers in QA to understand what you want to do. So then when, Q, when quality assurance comes in and says, okay, what is the user story of this feature? Oh, they want me to walk and jump or just jump, but when I press this button, he jumps. Okay, then you can test it. He will test multiple times in direction, and then you could come back with, well, the jump is too low, too high. There are things that I cannot reach there. When I'm jumping, the delay of the button is too long, right? Because he understands what you want to do. It's much simpler for him to test it. So this works with everything. And this works when you're pitching as well. So when you're pitching to somebody and you want them to buy your game as a publisher, so you want them to invest. You don't do a list of feature, right? You're going to have four players in the world uh, wide as, uh, you know, two miles, two square miles. You're going to have forest and enemies. You're going to have 20 enemies and you're going to be able to beat them with a sword, right? That, that's not fun because those are features, right? You're going to be set on an adventure in a huge world where enemies are going to be everywhere around you. As a user, you need to survive find weapons there are over 26 weapons in the game and find friends there are over 14 characters you can ally yourself with to conquer the evil doer zarlog i'm just making things up but <laughs> this is how you need to sell the experience when you're pitching people so that they're excited so that they want to play your game the same way when i'm told this about a volvo i'm not excited about driving it to go fast and excited about driving it in winter in Montreal when there's 30 centimeters of snow that I know my family is going to be safe with me. Then you have to transfer your passion. I did that a bit right there. This is a bowl of um, tagliatelle with bolognese sauce. One of my favorite meals. I love making some bolognese. I love cooking and making food. And when I talk about transfer your passion is that you need to be able to talk about a dish and make people's mouth water. So if I explain to you how I make this pasta with how long I cook the veal and the beef and how long I do uh, my sauce simmering with tomato and, 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 and all that stuff in it, right? You are going to desire it. I, I'm not sure you guys like necessarily bolognese sauce, but what I mean is um, that's something it was easy for me to talk about but it's important to do the same for your game, right? So how are you going to transfer your passion to your team, right? Because you want them to be passionate about your game, but also to uh, investors and buyers and, and, and marketing and publishers, right? So when you want your team to do a game, let's say you sign a contract and, and you sign a contract for a kid's game, but your team wants to make Diablo. Uh, so all of a sudden they want to make a very adult game, but you sign a kid's game. And, and the team doesn't want to do it. They're like, this game is not interesting. Then you can sell the passion this way. Guys, we just signed this new contract and I think it's amazing because we're going to use this game 
to build technology and to learn how to create the map system, the fighting system for the next game that we want to do. We want to do that big RPG with dungeon crawling, fine, but this is a kid's game. And in that kid's game, they want to have something specific that is similar to what we want to do. So let's use that money and technology to build the, the frameworks that will enable us to do the game we want to do afterwards. So then all of a sudden, you're transferring your passion and your reasoning. Why did I do this, right? And then when you're pitching a game to somebody, um, especially early on, and I'm gonna cover that afterwards, when it's your first game, your second game, or you're very early on in your career, you gotta transfer that passion. And it's not only about the game, it's about you, right? Let's say you're meeting uh, with um, EA because you wanna do a, a sports game. And you start by doing this, right? I've played that sport my entire life, that sport, sorry. I've played that sport my entire life since I was a kid. And there's nothing more rewarding for me to do a pass at hockey to my friend when he receives it perfectly on the stick and then we skate at 40 kilometers an hour down towards the goal. And I, we look at each other and we do a couple passes, we dig the goalie and we score a goal and the crowd goes wild. That experience, I'm, I love it so much and the smell of the ice and the freshness of the, 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 the ice on, on, under my, my skates. I want to reproduce this in a game. We came up with a game idea for hockey that meets the action level of a RPG where it's a mixture of combat RPG and the sport of hockey. This is basically my passion project for the past 10 years and I am extremely excited to present it to you. As a publisher, as a marketer, I cannot deny the fact that you want to make this game, that you're passionate about this game. So transfer your passion by showing them why it's important to you. And for them, it's going to be impossible to say it's not, right? So it's important to me and that's why you should care. Really important. Don't do this alone. When I say don't do this alone, it's everything. Don't carry the burden of everything alone, whether it's biz dev, accounting, human resources, IT. If you have multiple partners, share that burden, for, uh, you know, communicate the issues. If you have a tough uh, bug in the game, don't just try to do it yourself on your own on the side and not requesting help. Um, you know, I the, the, probably the thing I'm the worst at in video games is programming or understanding programming. However, I have a, an approach of very basic problem solving, which is always finding the root of the problem and not the symptom. So when I used to work at Hibernum and my team was doing programming, they needed help oftentimes because they had big bugs that they couldn't solve. And sometimes just talking to me would help them find a different direction because of the questions I would ask. I would ask questions that could sound dumb, but I just needed to get more information. So why is that important for the game? What does the player want to do with that? Where are we going with that experience? And, and then all of a sudden you dig, you dig, you dig. And then you understand that it might not even be a bug. It might be a, a feature waiting to happen. Uh, or if it's a bug, you can find other ways to fix it. And in business development, it's the same thing. Um, when you go pitching, when you go to, to meetings, if you're the CEO and if you're alone in there, there's nobody you can rely on for your mistakes. What I mean by this is you're in a meeting, you're pitching, and then the company that you're pitching with, you know, there's always brainstorming. That's really unfortunate because it changes your game. And they start changing the game. Oh man, how about we do 10 characters instead of eight? And I know you said 2D, but I really think it should be cool in 3D. What, what do you think? And then you start building and, and because you're excited, because you feel you can get that sale, you're not going to say no. You're going to say yes and you're going to continue, right? However, then at the end, you show the budget. You're like, it's a million dollars. Okay, fine. You go back to your team, you tell them what you said, what you did, and they're like, well, this game is $2 million now, not $1 million. But you're like, but I said $1 million, and I'm the CEO. If I say something, it sticks, right? So then all of a sudden, you put yourself in a bad position that you are the last decision maker in your company, and you made a mistake. Using a business development person, a partner, a consultant, an agency, an employee, anything to pitch with you, when there's a mistake, it's easy to say, oh, I'm sorry, in the negotiation, we had a mistake. As the CEO, um, Louis can know how to do this properly, so it's not a million, it's two million. I'm definitely sorry. This is why I'm sure you understand. 
uh, let's continue talking, right? So it's a way of not being the last person, the last resort, but being able to fix those mistakes by using the power of your position. So never do these things alone. Always have a backup and you should almost never be the front facing person unless you're very small and just started. That's fine. But as you grow bigger, always do this in, in teams. So let's talk about more specific pitching. Um, I talk about pitching a lot because it's the number one way to find money for your game, for your company and for your studio. So um, you need to convince people that they should give you money on your game and on your company, right? So here's my business plan, give money for an investor in my company. Here's the game I'm making, give me money for my game specifically, right? Um, so it's a very long process and it will test your creativity and resiliency. What I mean by that is that one of the biggest problem in the games industry is the slow no. The slow no is meeting somebody at a conference or over a voice conference and they say, I really like it. I can't wait to see the next version. And then you send prototype B, prototype C, and they always comes back with, oh man, it's greatly improved. Can't wait to see the next version. So all of a sudden you're into the longest conversation nine months, 10 months, 12 months with no actual next steps about to do this. So here's a, you know, kind of a process of what you could expect, right? Uh, early concept, this is when you have a pitch, maybe a small prototype or a small video, what you want to do. The pitch explains the game, does not have all the features, it's pretty high level. So it's going to be highly focused on passion, fun, and wow factor, right? This is why this game is awesome. Uh, it's going to communicate your intentions, your theme, and your main features. Uh, so after you've done the passion and the wow, then you tell them this is how you're going to deliver the wow. And then you're going to show key art in the video. Maybe your artist do concept art. Maybe you do a little video. And then you're going to say budget range. I believe that this game is going to cost me between one to two million. So. As a new studio, studio that are just getting started, it's going to be extremely difficult to close at this stage, right? Because you need to prove that you can do this. So then you're going to start moving into deeper dives. Deeper dives are more focused on pillars, on USP, and on characters. So what you're going to do there is you're going to start almost designing your game uh, to to part uh, to um, to sorry, to exchange it with different publishers, right? So you're going to develop your game. You're going to have a bigger deck. You're going to have probably 30 slides. You're going to have your main creative pillars, your unique selling points and your characters. You're going to start showing the loops, right? So the game loops. What do you do when you come back? What do you do when you walk around? What do you do when you drive? What do you do when you fly, right? So those are the deeper loops, the story and the progression and again, a deeper USB. Then you're going to start showing a comprehensive budget and timeline because you know all your features the number of characters all the loops you're able to know all your features so you're able to evaluate this in a much more comprehensive way with the budget and the timeline then you're going to have an early prototype you're going to be able to show gameplay footage link with an early prototype the prototype might be ugly but the footage needs to be pretty so you, you show them like hey this is how it plays but this is how it's going to look and then you're going to have a market approach I'm not an expert at market that you should say, unless you are. And then you say, these are my expectation of who the target market is, what the competition is. And then you can start showing that you're looking into that as well. As a studio, you can start signing games there. Um, depending of how amazing the prototype and gameplay footage are with the design, there's a chance that you can find somebody there. Then you move to ready to sign. You're going to have a comprehensive view of design and main features, the complete budget and milestones, risk assessment, right? What is the risk assessment of being able to make this game? You're going to be in a complete go to market product overview because you're going to be exchanging with publishers, right? Based on what you told me, Mr. Publisher, two months ago, this is how we believe we would go to market. These are some of the key selling points for the marketing. And then you start exchanging, right? And this is what's going to allow you to uh to to go towards that uh that signature and then you're going to have the final overview of the entire project so this is when you should be ready to sign depending of the size of the game that you're doing this can be from two months to 12 months i've signed a game last week for one of my clients that we've been talking to sign for the past 12 months uh so you never know some takes three months 
but it's usually rarely less than three to six months. Meeting in person when permitting is recommended to find a publishing partner, especially if you're getting started. This is a map of the world with all the different conferences of video games. There's some in Turkey, in Brazil, there's in Japan, there's in China, there's in the United States and Canada, a lot in Europe. They are gaming uh, shows everywhere. And those are the bigger ones. So there's some regional shows all the time as well. Uh, there are hundreds of conferences, some big, some small. Going there in person is critical when you can travel again. Uh, same thing for me, I haven't traveled uh, in a long time, but when we can all travel again, this is where things happen because people want to see you. They want to get to know you, not only about your game, but it's about you. So you should be traveling in person to meet as much as possible, and this is costly. So you need to plan this well with your partners early on when you do the distribution of the, the task and the budget. You need to remember this. Travel is, is an expensive one. Managing the feedback received while pitching is important. I don't know if you guys are a fan of The Simpsons, but this is the card that Homer Simpson designed after doing, looking at everybody's letters of what they feel a car should look like. I will not drive this car. The problem, this happens often in games as well. You start pitching your game. You get feedback by 20 publishers. They all give you different feedback. And then you look at this and you think that you need to do this to sign. So you believe that you need to fit all these features that people told you in order to sign the game. This is going to denaturalize your game. This is going to make it a Frankenstein game and you're never going to sign it. So when you receive feedback, sit with the team, evaluate if the person giving feedback understood your unique selling point, your pillars, your creative vision and design and passion. If he did, then pay more attention. But if he did not and just gave you feedback without understanding, or if it's your 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 uncle, your your friend that likes games, your your brother-in-law that likes games but really doesn't understand how to make games, then be careful because then you could be listening to people that don't necessarily have more experience than you. So always be very cautious about that and evaluate the process of the game uh, intelligently. Your team is as important as your game. I said that earlier. That's why you need to travel. That's why you need to meet people uh, when you can or or do a group call with 17 members that are important to the studio with the investor because early on any investors that will choose your project will bet on you and your team. So they're going to look at your pitch. They're going to look at your game design, knowing that the game that you're pitching now won't be the game that you're going to ship in 12 months because games change all the time but they're going to basically th make that decision by asking themselves, do I believe that Louis and his team can deliver on their promise? And do I want to work with them for the next 24 months to make this happen? And that's the most important thing. So remember that. So remember the 80-20. Remember all these things together to transfer your passion, to talk to these people the right way, to find the common ground and to to use the 80-20 to figure out who's talking and who's moving what, and don't do this alone. And that's how you're going to use your team to get those deals. So that's a big overview of what I believe getting started in the gaming world as an entrepreneur is. There's many different facets. There's many different approaches. There's no formula. There's no recipe. There's just lowering your head and moving forward and doing the best you can. So I would love to hear your questions. So I know, Marosh, you've been looking at that. So please hit me with some questions. <laughs> Absolutely, Luisa. Thank you. Um, so you have just said that you know there is no uh, set recipe, but I would say that uh, you know there is uh, there are no, no 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 market is the same as the other. And uh, when it comes to that, uh, would you have any advice uh, for uh, perhaps startups or uh, you know, young entrepreneurs trying to break in into e gaming industry? Uh, in the markets that are you know, less developed when it comes to e-gaming uh, landscape? Yes, that's a very, very good question. I understand that the kingdom is not a place where there's a tons of studios. So if you're here talking with me, guys, and you want to learn how to make games, but you're like, there's nobody around me making games with me. How do you do it? The internet is your friend. The conferences online, in person are your friends meet people that are making games. The community of game makers around the world is extremely welcoming. 
talk to people anywhere. They are going to gladly help you. To give you an idea, I, you could talk to the creator of Grand Theft Auto V, the biggest game of, uh, of all time. He actually works with me. So you could contact this person on LinkedIn or Facebook and say, wow, I heard you made this game. Do you mind chatting with me? I'm in Saudi Arabia and I want to launch my studio. That person will take the call. So a very few people will say no to that. Um, we love helping new game makers, so that's really important. That's number one. Number two, be vocal. Find other people that are passionate about games in the kingdom. Associate yourself with them. Create an association of game makers. Exchange ideas and concepts. Talk to your government. Ask for help. Uh, look at what has been done in Montreal, in Canada. Look at what has been done in, in locations like uh, the United States where groupments of people, there's organization of game makers everywhere. Find a way to create that, find a way to, to meet those people and, and find a way to create and stimulate your industry internally. And conferences like this with Ernst & Young is very good because we can talk to people and show that e-gaming is important everywhere in the world. So it creates uh, an, um, a desire to make it work. So that's what I would say. So focus internally by making it a passion project in your region, but then also go see other people that have done it so that you can get great ideas and great feedback. Right, so so let's say that a few aspiring entrepreneurs will get together, let's say in Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you know, they just graduated and they are uh, about to, you know, test their luck in, uh, you know, in the gaming industry. They, you know, found their startup and along the way, it comes to a point where, okay, they probably released their first games, maybe a couple of games, uh, mobile games, you know, uh, published them on Apple Store, they published them on, uh, uh, you know, the Google Play Store, and they're doing fairly decent. And now they're facing the, the, the challenge where to expand their services, essentially to build up their back office, to, to cater for all the services they were uh, most likely outsourcing uh, until that point. When do you think this should happen? What is the maturity stage that the startup should be at uh, before uh, going fully in-house? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, I see this done. You know, people add those services internally too fast, and or some add, add them too late. At Hibernum, what we did is we believe that when we add about forty to fifty people, it was time to add human resources and IT internally, right? So people had requests for computers and had requests for human resources, and those those requests were becoming uh, more and more often, so it was stopping us from working on this. Um, it also depends of the, the make of the partners, right? So if you have a partnership with a guy that's great in finance, you might not need that early on. For us, uh, we did not have anybody in finance, so when we started, uh, generating profits and we were about 70 people, that's when we brought in an accountant. So I would say is when you start having an overload of, of projects and management of people, 40 to 50 people is a good time to say, okay, let's bring in human resources, let's bring in IT. Um, it also comes up with what I say is the overhead cost, right? So if you're selling your resources and you want to be profitable, you don't. You have to remember that adding accounting internally, adding legal, adding IT, and adding HR, those are costs that are not making gains. So you have to add those costs to the total cost so that you can cover their salaries, right? So all of a sudden, your cost increases because of that. So there's a, there's a matter of size at which you're in a great position to not to, to add people because you don't dilute, you, you can dilute your cost more. The legal aspect of it, I, I always waited. Uh, I think there are great video game lawyers that are very specialized in, in law for video games, but then there's corporate lawyers. So it's rare that you're gonna find one lawyer that can do everything. So I would always use external lawyers. So, you know, by the time we were a hundred people, we had three human resources, one accountant uh, in the team, and that was enough for us to, to move forward at that size. Okay, I think that that's that's pretty clear. So let's let me leave with another another example. So you are a, a startup, and uh, you're you're you know you, you are having a somewhat uh, successful journey. Do what, what do you do when it comes to equity? And you know I'm leading from a way where um, 
the equity uh, typically becomes uh, one of the you know biggest carrots to attract the right talent, especially in a, in, in a, in a startup culture. So. Uh, would you have any insights on dilution or uh, trying to keep more equity with the uh, original founders to maintain the coherence? Uh, yeah. Any, any yeah. thoughts on that? It's this one is a is a tough question because it also depends of your about your culture sees equity, right? If you look at a, uh, companies that start in California in the U.S., they like giving shares away like their candy bars. They just like diluting and all that. I don't like diluting a lot because. The way I see it is the following. As an owner, you're the one who take, takes all the risks. If the company fails, you're the one that's responsible, right? You could be personally responsible financially for a lot of the failures. So I try to limit um, the number of people that get stuck or at least that get voting stuck. So the way I structure my, my company currently, I have what I call a system of phantom stock, which is a bucket of stock that people can get that will only make them money if we sell the company. So, hey, you are a director level. I really like how you work. I want to I want to uh, keep you happy. So here's an amount of stock that represents maybe one or two percent of the company. So if we liquidate and sell and make a lot of money, you're going to be taken care of. Uh, so for stock, that's how I approach it. For my partners, depending on their ability to be uh, voting rights or not voting rights, I, I, I evaluate that very properly. But the best way I do it is profit sharing. I have a bonus pool system where everybody will generate profits and bonuses if the company does really well. So it's not necessarily about giving them stock, but there's a pool of bonus. If every year I take the profits, I take a percentage of those profits and I redistribute it amongst the employees. So everybody is happy and it encourages teamwork. Because if you have a lot of people, let's say in business development, they're going to want to have their commission. But if you have a bonus pool that everybody participates, it's much more teamwork, which is what I like the most. I prefer teamwork over competition. Um, so that, that's how I approach it. So it very much depends on your culture. I think it's important that the original owners retain um, voting uh, veto as long as possible. So be uh, the majority as long as possible. And then you can play with different kinds of stock to give phantom stock, uh, liquidation bonuses or bonus pools uh, to make sure that you keep your rights. Right, uh, and we are we have actually received, uh, as you were answering, we have just received a follow up question on, on the same topic, uh, which is uh, about the revenue sharing model. So I understand that you are wrapping everything, the whole incentive uh, scheme around the performance, and that you are trying to be more conservative about uh, giving out the, you know, giving out the equity too loosely. However, uh, in a, in a startup culture, I, I would assume that your fixed salaries will be a challenge, right? You want to get very good uh, talent, uh, probably one of the best that is on the market, but you are probably not generating too much of a revenue right at, at, the, at the onset where the talent is absolutely crucial. So and at the same time, you do not want to hand out or give up too much of an equity. So would a, some kind of a revenue sharing model um, work as a compromise? So you are not giving up too much of a fixed, co uh, fixed salaries, but at the same time, you're not giving up the equity while still uh, being able to reward your employees with uh, with something that is closely tied to the company's performance. Yes, so it's a very good question. It's a very tricky one. It depends of your ambitions, and I'll tell you why. So equity goes to the original partners, but then you see two new guys that are super good that you want to bring on board, right? The problem with revenue share is that a lot of revenue in a startup should be reinvested in growth, right? I should take my prof my revenue and try to reinvest by hiring more people to do bigger games, better games, so that the, the revenue and profits can grow. So if you take a lot of revenue out to redistribute it amongst your top employees, then you're not hiring new ones. So that's why, that's why I did the profit share and not revenue share. If you absolutely want to do revenue share, then it becomes almost like a commission. Um, and it, it depends on what the, the, the new employee wants. But I would recommend against revenue share and commission model because it gives it, it's more difficult to 
be ambitious and grow your company that way because a small group of people get all the revenue. But if it's profit share, then they have to focus on making better, bigger, bigger, better games and having a better core team so that the profits can grow. So it's a it's a slight formula change if if, if that's okay. Right. Yeah. Very clear. And I would probably just add on top of that the revenue sharing model, uh, if applied to people who are actually generating business, might also promote maybe undesired uh, incentives in a way that someone might maximize revenue, but at the same time be taking less profitable deals for the studio. So uh, yeah. that might be that might be quite a challenge as well. All right. Maybe okay. let let me finish with last question before we yeah. before we conclude. Uh, the last question will be: If you would have to choose a, a, a trial entrepreneurs at the beginning to form a team, would you go with purely technical team, or would you already bring on board someone with more of the soft slash business skills? Uh, that's a tough one. That's a really good question. Um, I'm biased because I don't have technical skills, but um, I would say that if I would go only technical, at least one of these technical guys need to have a little bit of business savvy, a little bit. I've seen technical guys at conferences and shows trying to pitch and it's horrible. <laughs> so at least one of these guys need to have a little bit of those skills. Um, and and if it's the opposite, if you go only business, one business and technical, that business guy needs to be very versatile, right? Because if he's only good at pitching and biz dev and marketing, I mean, what use is that when you're in concept phase, right? So I think you need to have one person that's kind of a jack of all trades when you start. Somebody that say, hey, okay, yeah, I know, I'm just a marketing guy, but I'm good at organizing, so I'll be the producer, and also um, I'll be the community manager. So I'll start creating a community by putting our game on social. Or the other one is, okay, guys, I'm the I'm a good programmer, but also I have skills in uh, presentation building and presentation. So I'll be also the guy doing this, right? So versatility early on is very important, especially when it comes to business versus tech or versus game making. Absolutely. I think this is a, this has been a super informative session. Uh, and with that, uh, I will probably conclude and uh, thank everyone for joining us today, but over, also over the course of previous modules, we have together covered the whole industry overview. We have learned the concepts of marketing when it comes to e-gaming. We have discovered the whole design thinking process. We explored uh, Luis's entrepreneur journey and uh, closed with a very insightful information about entrepreneurship basics. Uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank, uh, to say my thanks uh, to Ministry of Communications and Information Technology of Saudi Arabia. Without, and we would not be able to share this knowledge with you. And I would all also like to thank uh, Rocket Ride Games and Louis for making it that much more insightful. Thank you, everyone, once again, and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Maraj. Thank you, everybody. It was great to be with you. Thank you.